Um, I want to read to you a letter that Bobby Fischer wrote to the Encyclopedia, Encyclopedia Judaica. You guys know Encyclopedia Judaica? Um, so Bobby Fischer, you guys know Bobby Fischer, the uh, great chess champion, protege, uh, wunderkind. He was a chess genius and champion at a very, very young age. He was also known at a time of Russian dominance of chess, so he was one of the few uh, Americans who were competitive. And uh, in his later life, he became a recluse and he had a very sad life. He uh, sort of dropped off the map and um, it's, it's, a, it's a sad story, very sad story about how he never really adjusted to normal life. He was a genius at chess and seemed to be very, very angry and frustrated and not very well adjusted for anything other than being a, uh, a grandmaster at chess. But at any rate, um, so here's a letter that he wrote. Uh, June 28th, 1984, to Encyclopedia Judaica offices in Manhattan. Gentlemen, knowing what I do about Judaism, I was naturally distressed to see that you have erroneously featured me as a Jew in Encyclopedia Judaica. Please do not make this mistake again in any future editions of your voluminous pseudo-authoritative publication. I am not today nor have I ever been a Jew, and as a matter of fact, I am uncircumcised. I suggest, rather than fraudulently misrepresenting me to be a Jew, and dishonestly abusing my name and reputation as a kind of advertising gimmick to improve the image of your religion, you try to promote your religion on its own merits, if indeed it has any. In closing, I trust that I am not being unrealistically optimistic in thanking you in advance for your anticipated cooperation in this matter, Truly yours, Bobby Fischer, the world chess champion. So that's how Bobby Fischer felt about being described as a Jew. Okay. Um, if you were to ask me, not my personal opinion, but what does halacha say, meaning what does Jewish law say, if you would ask me, I mean, he's he since passed away, but if you would ask me, is there any question if Bobby Fischer was Jewish? The answer is, there's no question. I mean, he was born to a Jewish mother. He was, then that's it. I mean, that's, that's, that, that, there you go. Bobby Fischer was Jewish. But apparently being referred to as Jewish was a very sore spot for him. And in fact, I think it was in the 70s already, he joined some type of a Christian cult. My point just is that here's an example of somebody who vehemently denied his, his Jewish identity. I'm telling you for halachic purposes, um, wow, I don't like how that sounds, for halachic purposes. That makes it sound like, like I'm minimizing it. Uh, halacha means Torah law. Torah law is the reality. God's law de determines the reality in God's world. So let, let me take out those scare quotes, halachic purposes, and just say, in all reality, in God's reality, Bobby Fischer remained a Jew even a wayward Jew, a rebellious Jew, a self-hating Jew, whatever you want to say, but he remained a Jew and remains a Jew. Um, why am I talking about this? Why am I talking about this? So, um, it is not a new idea that Jewish people would disassociate from the Jewish people, uh, from the Jewish um, nation. Um, this week's Parsha, Parsha's Bay, is the third Torah reading in the book of Shmois, of, of the book of Exodus. And we're, we're reading about the Exodus from, from Egypt. So, I just want to read to you from, from this week's Parsha. Vayet Moshe's Yodei al Moshe, Moses held out his hand toward the sky. There was a thick darkness. 
Eretz Mitzrayim upon the entire land of Egypt, Shleishes Yomim, that endured for three days, lasted three days' time. Okay, so Rashi, who's our foremost commentary, explains what was the deal with this. This is one of the ten plagues, the plague of darkness. So he explains a few things, but I just want to jump ahead to uh, just one part of it, where Rashi says, why specifically did God bring upon the Egyptians darkness? In other words, they could have done a lot of things to them. So why Cheshech? What was the purpose of Cheshech, of darkness? And Rashi explains it wasn't just that the darkness was meant to inflict discomfort or terror upon the Egyptians. There was a functional purpose as well to the darkness. He says, Shahoyu be Yisrael hadair, that there were among the Jewish people in that generation, Rashayim, wicked people, they didn't want to leave. They didn't want to leave. They knew that the Exodus is coming, they, they didn't want to take part in it. Umesu, and they died in Egypt, they never left indeed. They didn't want to leave. They didn't leave. They died during the three days of darkness. Why during that time? So that the Egyptians shouldn't have the satisfaction of seeing their downfall. The Yemru and say, they are being struck down along with us. In other words, it was a private matter that uh, there were those who were not going to leave Egypt, but that was none of the Egyptians' business. So it was done under the table, so to speak. Now, you might ask, how common was this? How, what are we talking about numbers-wise? So I want to skip ahead to next week's Parsha, to Parsha's B'Shalach. Um, so it says, Vayase velikim es ha'am uh, Hashem made the people go roundabout, circuitously, derech ha-midbar yamsuf, uh, by way of the wilderness of the Sea of Reeds, v'chamushim olu v'nei Yisrael, may add its Mitzrayim. And the Jewish people went up out of the land of Egypt, chamushim. What does chamushim mean? So, again, Rashi, our foremost commentary, explains what this word chamushim means, and he gives us a couple of explanations, not entirely satisfied with either of them. That's what Rashi does when he doesn't feel, feel that one answer is completely satisfactory, so he gives another. So, w one meaning is um, that they were armed. They were armed. But then he gives another explanation. Dover Acher means alternatively. Chamushim, the word Chamushim means Echod Mechamisha, one out of five, one out of five, one fifth. Yotsu, left, one out of five, left. Varbo Chalokim, and four parts. Of five, meaning 80%. Mesu Bishlesha died during the three days of darkness. Rashi gets this from the Medrash from Michelta. And uh, it's a wild concept that 80% of the Jewish people at that time didn't want to leave and therefore did not leave and they quietly passed away during the three days of darkness. That's just absolutely wild. Now, yeah. So, not to scare anybody, especially the Balabastas, but Pesach's in a couple of months. So, uh, yeah, it's in uh, 10 weeks. Yeah, start cooking. Start cleaning. At least start getting nervous. Um, <laughs> we had the class about anxiety. We took away everyone's anxiety. So now Pesach's coming to return the anxiety. Yeah. <laughs> um, in the Haggadah, 
we famously have the four sons. The Torah speaks famously again, uh, corresponding to four children. Um, that's referring to four different places in Torah where a where a father is responding to a child and explained to, explaining to him the significance of uh, of the observance of Passover. So our sages took those four. Uh, verses and said they, they, they are, there are four different verses because you need four different ways of responding to four categories of children. And there's much to be said about the four children, um, but I just want to focus on the one who's called the Ben Rosha, the, the wicked child. It says, Rosha, Mohu Eimer, the wicked one, what does he say? He says, Moha Veda Hazais Lachem. What is this service? He's referring to the Korban Pesach, to the the sacrifice of the of the Paschal Lamb. And in our days when we don't have that because the temple isn't standing, then he would be referring to the other rituals of Passover observance, the matzah and the bitter herbs and uh, the wine. So at any rate, he says, What's this? What's going on here? Uh, what is or rather, what what what's this? For you, Lochem, what does this mean to you? Lochem Valai. To you, not to him. In other words, in his question already, he's um, standing apart from what's happening and he's saying, What does this mean to you guys? What is this that you guys have going on? Meaning he doesn't include himself. <sighs> I'm reading from the Haggadah. And because he excludes himself from the group, it is tantamount to the most uh, heretical statement. Basically, by denying that he has any part in the Jewish people, he's denying all of Judaism. And you should blunt his teeth, and there are different explanations if that's a figure of speech, if it's poetic. We're not going to get into this. You should blunt his teeth, let's just say you should answer him harshly, and you should tell him. Why am I making this observance? Because of what the Lord did for me when I left Egypt. Leave a lie lie. The father says, for, for, him, for himself, for, for me, not, not for him, not for the son. Meaning you want to exclude yourself? Fine, you're excluded. This happened to me, it didn't happen to you, no problem. As you please. Eluho Yasham, the Haggadah continues, if you would have been there, Nigol, you would not have been redeemed. And of course, we know that wasn't uncommon. In fact, that was more common than uncommon. So the father tells this son, who's sort of questioning his Jewish identity, yeah, no problem. This is not a new issue that we're facing as Jews. We had people like you back in Egypt. And you know what? None of them left. So with your attitude, you would have been one of those who didn't leave. That's it. So congratulations. Now. I'll ask, a, I'll, I'll ask an emotional question, then I'll ask a more scholastic question. The emotional question is, ouch. Like, that, that's painful. Like, why is a father speaking to a child like this? But I'll, I'll ask a more scholastic question, which is, the Haggadah is, uh, is educational. It's teaching us about the redemption from Egypt. And in fact, the way that we do the mitzvah of talking about the Exodus is by following the Haggadah. So, the question really is, this little extra zinger, that twist of the knife, like where he says, it, don't, don't worry, it's not you, it's me. Eh, yeah, yeah, it's me. It's my thing, not your thing. But then that extra, and by the way, if you would have been in Egypt, you wouldn't have gone out. Why does it have to be included? Forget about the fact that it's, I mean, it's hard to forget, but set aside for a moment that it's so harsh to even to read these words but just from a from from, from a teaching point of view what is the Haggadah teaching us by including those lines is there anything 
Is there, is there anything didactic? Are we, is there a lesson that we can glean from these words? So, the answer is yes. Yes, we can glean quite an important lesson from these words. And, and that is, first let me preface by saying that the exodus from Egypt was the first redemption of the Jewish people. It is the archetypical redemption of the Jewish people. But it is certainly not the ultimate redemption. And the proof of it not being the ultimate redemption is that after we were redeemed from Egypt, and we were no, no longer slaves to Pharaoh, but we ended up being exiled by other world powers, the, the Babylonians and the Romans and the Persians and the Greeks. So uh, it's not the ultimate, but it is the archetype. And it is the precedent that sort of establishes what redemption means. But it's not the ultimate, meaning it's not everything that a redemption could be. The ultimate redemption, the redemption which is everything that you would ever want from a redemption and more, what we call the Geula Shlema, the complete redemption, the Geula Shlema, the complete redemption, is Al Yedei Mashiach Tzidkenu. That is through our righteous anointed one, who is a descendant of King David. And he is the sort of Moses figure of, just like Moses was in the redemption from Egypt, so Mashiach, the descendant of King David, is the redemptive figure and leader in the ultimate redemption, the Geula Amitis Vashlema, the true and complete redemption, and that's what makes it true, what makes it complete, is that there's no gullus after it. It doesn't lapse, it's permanent, it's eternal. Um, in fact, metaphysically, if we can speak metaphysically for a second, the, the, the ultimate redemption is a revelation of infinity within the finite world. Um, and part of that is its eternality, it's infinite. Another part of it, by the way, is that a subsequent stage of the redemption is the, the resurrection. Because at that point, even physical life will be shown to, to be permanent, not fleeting, not, not uh, ephemeral, but rather eternal as an expression of, of God's infinity. At any rate, the point is that whenever we learn about the exodus from Egypt, we're not just learning history, we're learning about a template and how it sets patterns for what is going to happen, but also, significantly, the way that the ultimate redemption, being the ultimate redemption, meaning being greater than any of its predecessors, the way that the pattern will actually uh, be different. Because when Mashiach comes, it will be different. I mean, it's, it's categorically different. It's, it's a redemption from which there is no subsequent uh, going back into exile or slavery. So it is categorically different. One of the ways in which the true and complete redemption is different than the redemption from Egypt, or any other rede redemption in our history for that matter, is... Who gets redeemed? Who experiences redemption? Um, in Sefer Dvarim, in the book of Deuteronomy, towards the end of, of Moses' life, he is preparing his flock, and um, he tells them about the end of days it tells them what it's going to be like when things sort of all fall into place and the purpose for which the world was created becomes revealed and we experience a fulfillment of of the perfection that was the the original plan from the outset so one of the things that we experience is vashava shamalikecha shvuscha the Lord, your God, will return your captivity. 
Um, and Rashi, again, we, we, we go to Rashi, tells us some fascinating things about this, uh, including, I don't want to go off on this uh, uh, as a tangent, but from the wording of this verse, it implies that not only will Hashem return us from our captivity, but Hashem will return from captivity. It's, a, it's an intransitive verb. Not He'll make you return, but He Himself will return. Because Hashem Himself, as it were, was exiled from His world, so to speak. And when His people are reinstated, when they are taken out of exile, so too is Hashem Himself coming home. I think we have to mention that uh, Yud Shvat, the 10th day of the Hebrew month of Shvat is coming, which is the anniversary of the passing of the 6th Rebbe of Chabad, and then uh, one year after that, the 7th Rebbe uh, assuming leadership on the, on the yard site of his predecessor. And uh, the Rebbe's first mimer, his first discourse, his inaugural address, was Bosi Lagani Achei which are words from Shira Shirim, from the Song of Songs of Shlema Melech of King Solomon. And uh, that line is Hashem speaking. Hashem says, Bosi Lagani, I've come to my garden. And as the Medrash explains, um, when they built the Mishkan, they built the physical sanctuary for God in the, in the desert, he called it a homecoming because he said, now I can return to my, he called the world, the physical world, my garden. He said, I was expelled through various different sins which repelled me, but now you've brought me back to the world and I'm, I'm coming home. This is, this, is where I, this is where I yearn to be. And of course, uh, that was only the revelation of God in the physical world in one very specific location, in the Holy of Holies of the sanctuary which traveled in the wilderness and then later on when they built a permanent uh, structure in, in Jerusalem. But ultimately when Mashiach comes, and again, <laughs> the, the Gula Shleima is, is a complete Gula in so many ways. Another way in which it's complete is that that revelation of God will not just be in a place in the physical world, it will be in the entirety of the physical world. So the entire world, the entire physical plane will become God's home. Um, that's, that's what we refer to as Dira B'tachtenim. That's what the Madrash uh, Tanchuma refers to as a dwelling place in the lower realms, which is what Hashem desires. At any rate, so Rashi tells us that this, this verse here, V'shav Hashem alikecha shvuscha, uh, means that Hashem will return, the Jewish people will, re will return. Um, but I, what, what I wanted to read you from the Rashi here is one particular... V'oid yesh um, yeah. So first he says, Hashem himself is returning, because Hashem himself is in exile. Shechinta bagolosa, as Chazal, as I say, just put it. The, the divine presence itself is, is in exile. But there's another explanation, Rashi says. Shegadol yem kibbutz galuyas ubekoshi, that the day of the ingathering of the exiles will be so great and so difficult as it, it is as if he himself will need to hold by the hand each, each, each individual Jew from their place, meaning from their place in Gullus. In other words, it's not just going to be something where uh, Hashem's going to say, all right, everybody, let's go. And then everyone's going to come rushing to return to their homeland. No, there are people who are going to need coaxing. We call it hand-holding, that's the idiom in English. But Rashi literally says he's going to have to hold their hand. mamish. He's going to have to hold them by their hands. There will be Jews when the moment of the true and complete redemption comes, uh, who are like, uh, I don't know, I mean, I don't even have a shul membership. Are you sure, that, are you sure this is my, th it's okay, you know, let me know how it is when you get there. Maybe I'll visit once in a while. <laughs> and Hashem himself, Rashi says, is going to, I mean, obviously this is poetry, but whatever it means, it's equivalent to the idea of Hashem himself taking each individual by the hand and saying, come, come, let's go. Ke'inyin shenemar. And then Rashi quotes a verse, like it says in the, the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 27, 13, Yeshio. 
Va'atem to look to la'achod echod b'nei Yisro, which means this, this verse in Isaiah is talking about the day of the redemption. He says that you're going to have to take them one by one. Yeah, so let's go back to the Ben Rasha, to the wicked son, the estranged son, the disenfranchised son at the Seder. We tell him that, okay, no problem, leave, aloy, aloy, it happened to me, not to you. And then we add that knife-twisting comment, Elohoyasham, if you would have been there, Lohoya Nigol, you would not have been redeemed. What's the purpose of this? What are we supposed to learn? What is the Haggadah trying to let us in on? An important piece of information about how the true and complete redemption will differ from the redemption from Egypt and every other redemption. And that is, the father tells the son, your attitude is not a new attitude. In fact, the majority of our people in Egypt had such an attitude, and they didn't leave Egypt. And in fact, as terrible as this is to say, if you would have been there, you wouldn't have left. But there's an implication in that statement. If you would have been there, if you would have been there, you would not have been redeemed. And the true and complete redemption through our righteous Redeemer, you can keep up this attitude. I hope you don't keep up this attitude. I hope you have a change of heart. But even if Mashiach will come and say, let's go, and you're going to say, I have nothing to do with you. And if you put me in the Encyclopedia Judaica, I'm going to sue you. You can say whatever you want. You're coming with. If God himself has to hold you by the hand and bring you into a redemptive state. Now, let, let's, let's talk a little bit more about this. Why is it different? Why is the redemption through Mashiach different than the uh, then you see Mitzrayim and all other previous redemptions. So I'm going to do my best to try to explain it to you, but I want to admit before I start, I don't completely get it. And even though I don't completely get it, I didn't want to. I didn't think it was fair that you should suffer because I'm not 100% clear on this idea. Um, and I just want to explain something. There are ideas, I mean, most of the ideas I teach are pretty deep. Not that I'm a deep thinker. I didn't come up with the ideas that I teach. I, I, I learned them from the, from the holy books. And most of the ideas are pretty deep in the holy books, and they take me years sometimes to figure them out to a point where I even feel competent enough to dare to speak about them publicly. This idea, I don't really feel like I have a handle on it so well, but I'm going to speak about it anyway because, well, Mashiach is coming, so at least I should do my best to tell you what's about to happen. Um, so here's the deal. When the Jewish people were redeemed from Egypt, Hashem described us, even prior to the redemption, he told uh, Moses to tell Pharaoh that we are b'ni b'chayri. Hashem called the Jewish people my, my, my son, my, my firstborn. So Hashem metaphorically compared us to children. And, then, and elsewhere in the Torah also says, Bonim Atem, <coughs> you the Jewish people are called Hashem's children. Um, but that was before the redemption, and more specifically before the revelation at Sinai. When we speak about chosenness, when we speak about that you chose us as a nation, what, what event signifies that choosing? It's the event of the revelation at Sinai. 
At Sinai, every single Jewish soul was present, even those of all future righteous converts from subsequent generations. So literally every Jew was present, not just all of those who made it out of Egypt, but every future Jew. And um, that's when we were chosen. And it's funny because we were already his children, but then we got chosen. <laughs> Seemingly, you don't have to choose your child. You're stuck with your child. <laughs> like, this is, this is family. What can you do? I can't change that fact. But I'm going to tell you what the Lubavitcher Rebbe explains in, uh, in the Kuti Sichas. And uh, I don't entirely get it. He says that a father's relationship with a child is natural. And as such, it's sort of a lower level relationship, relatively speaking. Because it's nature which compels you to have this connection. But choosing comes from a deeper place. Now, choosing is not what we normally, when we say bechira, we translate it as choosing. Usually, in English, when we say choosing, we mean choosing something based on merits, like pros and cons and that kind of stuff, which is a, an informed choice. You get the consumer reports, and you, then you figure out which, which car to buy. That's not what bechira, that's not what choosing means. Choosing actually means random choice, like random selection, I think is the closest you can get to it. Except it's not machine-generated randomness, it's true randomness um, that comes from the deepest depths of the soul. That's how Chassidus explains it. If I choose something based on a reason, it's coming from my intellect. If I choose something seemingly randomly, it's coming from my essence. So if I choose to be loyal to my kin, either it's because I see that it's expedient and therefore it's an intellectual choice, so it's coming from my intellect, or even if I don't see that it's expedient, but I can't fight it because there's this nature compelling me. Okay, but that's nature. Nature is not my essence. Nature is sort of like a, a software that's put into the system that makes, I mean, you see it even in the animal kingdom, that, that there's a certain loyalty, uh, at least in, in many species, between children and parents. Um, but when something is selected, And make no mistake, we understand that the, the, the chosenness is not an indication of superiority. To the contrary, if we would have been chosen based on any virtues, then that's not true random selection. Then it's an informed choice based on reasons. And then, actually, our relationship with God would be as tenuous as those reasons. In other words, maybe we were really something special 3,300 such years ago, but then you know, uh, what have you done for me lately? And that we don't have those virtues anymore, so God would stop selecting us. Or maybe some other nations who were, uh, you know, the Cinderella story. They came up from behind, and they emerged, and they surpassed us, and now God would choose them. But the point is that the choosing was never based on rational reasons. And it wasn't even based on the nature, the natural pull of a father to a child, it was, again, this is, this is such clumsy language, but the closest I can, I can get to it is to say true randomness, just to say, this is what I'm, this is what I'm choosing, this is what I'm choosing. And Chsivis explains that that choice is the essence, it's a revelation of the essence, it's the one way to express your true, your deepest selfhood. So when God chooses the Jewish people, he connects them to his essence. Which means that as long as we were a family, as long as it was just like it was in Egypt about, well, naturally a Jew gravitates to God because he calls us his children. We call him our father. So that's pretty compelling, but it's not fail-safe. It's not foolproof. And in fact, a person can choose to go against their nature, and they can renounce their family. But once we were chosen, once the essence of God himself connected to us and changed our essence, now 
You can renounce it, but it has zero effect. Ultimately, inevitably, the essence will have to come revealed. It is impossible. And therefore, we say really ludicrous things like, and, and I'm, I'm not trying to be funny when I say ludicrous. The, these are crazy statements that inevitably every Jew will do teshuva. They will, uh, they will all repent. Every Jew will repent. Well, how can you guarantee a thing like that? Why would you even make such an, uh, such an assertion? And, and the closest thing, again, I'm not, I haven't mastered this idea yet, but the, what Chassidus is explaining is that because it's not just a relationship, not even a really, really strong relationship like, like, a, like a kinship relationship, but because it became, became the essence of the Jew, ultimately you can deny your essence you can lie about your essence, you can be angry about your essence, but you can't do one thing to change it and ultimately it's going to come out and you're just going to have to accept it and you're going to have to own it and there's nothing you can do. So what we're saying is that the true and complete redemption, another way to, of describing the true and complete redemption is the true and complete redemption is the event or perhaps series of events in which the essence of every Jew will be forced to come to the fore. And it will no longer be possible for any Jew to live in denial of their essential identity. You could have done that in Egypt. You could have said, I don't identify with my family. But when Mashiach comes, there's, there's, there's no denial that will be effective anymore because essentially now your essence is that you belong to Hashem. And you can't deny that fact any more than you can deny being yourself. So for a Jew to say, well, you, you got the wrong guy, I'm not Jewish, is like somebody that's saying, I'm not me. Well, well <laughs> You are you. You can't not be you. I mean, I'm not trying to play semantic games. You can't, you cannot not be you. And, and you can do whatever you want to try to disprove that you are you, but ultimately, you are you. You know the, the story in Chelm about the guy who went to the bathhouse and uh, he was getting undressed and he got scared because he said, you know, in the bathhouse, if I don't have my clothes on, how will I recognize myself? Because everyone looks the same, undressed, so how am I supposed to know who I am? So he says, oh, I got an idea. He had a little red string in his pocket. He pulled out the red string, he tied it around his toe. So he says, when I get out of the bath and I want to find where my clothes are and I'll, I'll know which clothing to put on and which home to go home to, and I'll look for the guy with the red string on his toe and that, that'll be me because... I'm going to put it on right now. So he tied the, re the red string around his toe, and he went into the bath, but obviously in the bath, the, <laughs> the red string slid off. And he came walking out, and uh, he's looking around for a guy with a red string, and he looks at himself, he looks at others, he doesn't see any red string. Oh, no, he starts panicking. How am I going to know who I am? How am I going to find the right home? Well, the red string in the bath, somebody else stepped on it, and it stuck to that guy's foot. So all of a sudden the guy looks around and he sees another guy with a red string on his toe. The guy who stepped on the red string. So the original guy runs up to this guy and he says, Sir, can you help me? I know who you are, but do you have any idea who I am? <laughs> so it, it's, a, it's an absurdity because the one thing you can't not know is who you are. Because whoever you are, that's who you are. You can't change that fact. You can't not be you. You can act in a way that's self-betrayal. You can behave in a way where, you're, where you're, you're, you even behave opposite to your own interests and your own identity, but it doesn't change your identity. I'll tell you another Helm story. There's a guy from Helm went on a business trip. Maybe this is what's so foolish about the Helm people is that they, they it seems there's a lot of stories about them having an identity crisis. By the way, should, uh, I think it was Eric Erickson who innovated the uh, identity crisis. So maybe we should uh, take a look at Erickson again. But at any rate, so this, this guy from Helm was on a business trip. And he stopped off at uh, 
Oh, the, no, they made him get off the train because there was snow on the tracks. So everybody from the train had to get lodging in a hotel. He went to the hotel, and all the other passengers had already rented up all the, the rooms. So he's begging the clerk, please give me a room. I just need a room because I need to you know, just sleep a few hours, and I want to go back to the train station. The, the, the next train is in the morning at dawn. So he's like, I don't have any more rooms. I don't have. He says, please, please. So he says, you know, I have one room, but there's a Russian general staying in that room, and he, he, he doesn't want any roommates. He says, listen, I'll sneak in. I'll sleep for a few hours, and you come and just... Tap me before dawn, and I'll leave. I'll tiptoe out of there, and the general won't even know that I was in the room. So um, the, the clerk says, fine, okay, fine, I'll do it. So the helm guy goes into the room, and he gets undressed, and he gets into bed, and he sleeps for a few hours, and before dawn, the desk clerk comes, taps him, okay, silently gets up, silently in the dark, he gets dressed, and he doesn't realize in the dark he didn't put on his own clothes, he put on the, the Russian general's clothes. He didn't realize that, because it was dark. Now he's walking down the street, and he sees some soldiers walk by and they salute him. So, wow, it's pretty interesting, I'm getting saluted. He gets to the uh, desk of the, the, what do you call it, the train station, the depot, and he buys a ticket, they say, Sir, we're, we're not going to charge you, of course, uh, your, your ticket is paid for. And he's thinking, why is everybody treating me so nicely? And he turned around, he, he, it was, he, he passed a window, and he could see his reflection in the window, and he sees the uniform, he's wearing this full general's uniform. He says, oh no, that stupid desk clerk, he woke up the general, now I'm back in my room sleeping and I'm gonna miss the train. Okay, so again, even if you dress like a general, you didn't become a general and you're not back somewhere else sleeping, you're exactly right here where you are. But that's what I'm saying. You can live in a way that is a complete war against your identity. It won't change your identity. And when Mashiach comes, that war is going to be over. And there will be... There'll be peace, inner peace, that every Jew will be able to be at peace with his or her essence, which is their Jewish identity that was, that was established when, when God chose all the Jewish souls at Sinai. So, here's what I want to tell you. Bobby Fisher. The Lubavitcher Rebbe was looking for Bobby Fisher. He tried to get to him. The Rebbe tried to get the Bobby Fisher. You ever heard of Rashevsky, Sammy Rashevsky? He was one of the great grandmasters of chess. He was one of the few Americans who was competitive at that level, on the world class level in the 20th century. And he competed against Fisher. Rashevsky was also a Jew. He was born in Poland from a family of Gerich Sidim. But as a child, he moved to America, and he actually grew up in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. And in fact, in the 1940s, he had Yechidus with the sixth Rebbe of Chabad. And after the Friedrich Rebbe's passing, he continued to have a relationship with the seventh Rebbe. And Rashevsky was famous for being Shemer Shabbos. He kept Shabbos, yeah, he would not compete on Shabbos, and that was like a well-known thing. So, in 1982, he turned 70, and he wanted to retire. You know, in general, the Rebbe was against retirement. The Rebbe never retired. It spoke about, it's not good to retire. So Rashevsky was 70 already in 1982, and uh, he wanted to retire. The Rebbe told him, don't retire, you should continue to compete, because when you compete, it's a Kiddush Hashem. It's a sanctification of God's name. Why? Because he didn't compete on Shabbos. And it was a known thing. In fact, I'll tell you a story in a second where he competed with Bobby Fischer and his Shabbos observance actually factored into the story. Um, there was a... I want to go back in time a little bit to the 60s. Um, there was an incident that took place at the Beverly Hills Hilton called the Match of the Century. 
1961, between Bobby Fischer and Sammy Ryszewski, both American Jews. And um, it was Friday afternoon, and they, it was still tied, and they had to stop because of Shabbos. So they told Bobby Fischer, we're going to continue on Sunday morning. Bobby Fischer was not a morning person. Uh, they say he had the circadian rhythm of a bartender. So he slept in and he missed the Sunday match. And then they scheduled another match. He slept in for that too. And he forfeited. And then he sued the World Chess League. But at any rate, that's not even the main point of the story. I told you. So Ryshevsky was going to retire in 1982 at the age of 70. The Rebbe told him, continue to compete because you make a Kiddush Hashem when you compete because you keep Shabbos. So what happened is in 1984, at the age of 72, Ryshevsky went to the Reykjavik Open in Iceland. And he tied for first place. And afterwards, he got a letter from the Rebbe congratulating him on winning. In P.S. of the letter, and I'm going to read to you the P.S. of the letter. The following lines may appear strange, but I consider it my duty not to miss the opportunity to bring it to your attention. This is 1982. The Rebbe is told... Uh, or, or 1984, I'm sorry, 1984, Ryshevsky is 72 years old, the Rebbe has told him not to retire, and now he just tie, tied for first place at the Reykjavik Open. The Rebbe writes words of congratulations, and then a PS, and says, you may find this strange, but I'll, I'll feel remiss in my duty not to mention this. You are surely familiar with the life story of Bobby Fischer, of whom nothing has been heard in quite some time. This is the early 80s. Bobby Fischer dropped off the map in the 70s. Became a recluse, became a hermit. His, his, his strained relationship with his Jewish identity was one of many issues. He became very combative and very, uh, I mean, he, 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 was, he was, thank God in those days the paparazzi were not as uh, in full force as they are today because he was, uh, he, was a, he was a spectacle. He was somebody who had been a great, uh, hero of, of American culture. I, I told you, during the Cold War, he was the only American who was really competitive against the Soviets. And he had this tragic fall. So the Rebbe says, nothing's been heard. Where, where, where's Bobby Fischer? Unfortunately, he did not appear to have the proper Jewish education, which is probably the reason for his being so alienated from the Jewish way of life or the Jewish people. So the Rebbe here is giving a probable narrative. And he's stating it mildly that Bobby Fischer is estranged from the Jewish people. But the Rebbe's saying, what do you want from him? He didn't get an education. He grew up went going to a public school in Brooklyn, and he, he, he didn't get the right education. However, being a Jew, he should be helped by whomever possible. So Lamavich Rebbe sitting in Brooklyn, running his entire organization, and he has an entire community, he has chassidim, schools, and, 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 and congregations, and, and community centers, and any regular leader like that in that position would say, you know what, Bobby Fisher, he already chose his lot. Bobby Fischer has renounced the Jewish people. He's not our problem anymore. It's not our problem. Well, Bobby Shadab is writing to Sammy Ryshevsky and saying, listen, 72 years old, and he's giving him work. That's very typical of the Rebbe. Saying, I want you to go find out where's Bobby Fischer because he just he received a poor education. That's all that it, that's all it is. And he's Jewish. And he's it's because he's Jewish, we've got to help him. I'm writing to you about this since you are probably better informed about him than many other persons, and perhaps you may find some way in which he could be brought back to the Jewish fold, either through your personal efforts or in some other way. And Ryshevsky actually took the shlichus very seriously, and he went to L.A. 
where Fisher lived. I think he lived in Pasadena. And they met and they spoke for three hours. Now you're going to say, so then Bobby Fisher stopped renouncing his Judaism, and then he put on tefillin, and he became Shabbos observant, and he, a proud observant Jew. No. No, he didn't. This is not Hollywood. This is real life. The story happened in L.A., but it's not, it's not Hollywood. It's real life. And in real life, sometimes, we don't see the end of the story. You know, I had a dear, dear friend who was one of the most intelligent people I've ever known in my life, and he was a Buddhist priest. And we used to study Tanya together because he was Jewish. And when a Jew becomes a Buddhist, he can't be a regular Buddhist, he has to be the Buddhist priest, right? But we used to study Tanya together. And he was such a genius. We, I really enjoyed studying with him. But whenever I talk about him, and then people say, well, where is he now? I say, well, he passed away. And they say, well, w did, did he become religious before he passed away? And I say, no, this isn't Hollywood. He, he was cremated and his ashes were scattered in Tibet. Okay, because that's what happens in this gullus. That's what happens in this, in this crazy exile. That's what happens. But that doesn't make the truth any less true. The truth that remains true and eventually will be revealed to all as true is that even my friend who was cremated thinking that he was a Buddhist and even Bobby Fischer, who renounced his Jewish identity. And any other example you want to come and you want to bring to me and say, even him and even him and even her? Yes. Yes. And it's sad and it's tragic when somebody is so divorced from their own essence. Could there be a greater dysfunction than someone who is divorced from, them, from their own self? But what do you think redemption means? It means a lot of things. It means world peace. It means an end to hunger. It means an end to disease. It means a lot of things. But one of the things it also means, and all these things are, are, are connected, is that the essence will no longer be able to be hidden or, or distorted. And, and the, the true identity of every single Jewish person is going to be brought to the fore even if Hashem himself has to go on a case-by-case -case basis and take by the hand and, and bring with him and coax every individual Jew and say, it's okay, you can come home now. You can come back to yourself now. So, bottom line. Here's what we have to know. First of all, if you think that you're the Jew who's the wicked son and that there's no coming back and that you already wrote yourself off and you're even worse than Bobby Fischer. I, I highly doubt anyone sitting here tonight feels that way. I mean, maybe if I so see someone brand new, I never recognize it. I would say, oh, maybe they just wandered in. But uh, I highly doubt anyone sitting here feels that way about themselves. Maybe someone watching online right now, accidentally the algorithm did something weird and sent you to a rabbi and somehow you got almost an hour into a talk from a rabbi. Maybe you, you like chess and you saw it was about Bobby Fischer and you just started watching and you got to this point. So what I want to tell you is come back to yourself, come back to the truth, own who you are. You cannot undo who you are. Okay, that's one. But here's, here's the, I think, the more important lesson, and this is the call of the hour, and this is the work we that we have to do until Mashiach comes, and that is, when you meet one of your brothers and sisters who claim to not be a brother or a sister, you can tell them that's fine, because you know what? Back in Egypt, it was a clannish type of thing. It was brothers and sisters, and you could denounce the family, and you could say, I don't want to be part of this family, and it would work. <laughs> Back in Egypt, if you would say, I am giving up my, my uh, membership to this family, and it would work. And in fact, four-fifths of our people made that choice, and, 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 and they're gone. But once God brought you to Sinai, and I say you as an individual, he brought your soul to Sinai,
And he gathered you with all the Jewish souls around that, that mountain. And, and he revealed himself to us in his holy Torah and his will and his plan for the world. That's it. Your essence was changed and there's no going back. There's no way, there's no way to set back the clock and go back to, th to the way things were back in Egypt. So we have to have this message ready. We have to be clear about it. We can't get confused about it. I'm getting very, very concerned about the fact that in the Orthodox community, I'm seeing confusion about this, where people feel greater fellowship and affinity for people who share their ideological views than they feel an affinity and an essential connection to those who are fellow members of the Jewish people. Okay? I know it's... My friend Asi Spiegel from Tzfas was in town last week. I, he came to Soul Word Studios and we sat down and we spoke and he was talking about the fact that, you know, uh, nowadays we, uh, we were reminiscing, when we were Bachem, when we were Yeshiva boys, it was understood that most Jews you speak to are going to have a standoffish attitude and they're going to ridicule religion and they're going to, they're, going to, they're going to be at odds with you ideologically. But that was all part of the fun. We loved that. And we were kind of lamenting the fact that in today's day and age, in 2023, it seems like a lot of our colleagues have become comfortable with just associating in pockets of ideologically similarly thinking people where it just became sort of like, you know, you hang out with your, the people who you can discuss politics with without arguing. And it's like, that's, that's, you're missing the point. You're missing the point. Like, a Jew is a Jew is a Jew is a Jew. And, and if there's a Jew who disagrees with everything that you believe is Jewish, and let's say you're right. Not only you believe it's Jewish, you're right, you know what's Jewish, and you met a Jew who, who's antagonistic to every single idea that's a Jewish idea, okay, fine. So don't talk about anything with them. So give them chicken soup. So say l'chaim, so, so sing a song, so, so, so dance a dance. So give them a hug. But it doesn't change the fact that the essence is the essence. And so, very, very, very soon when Mashiach comes, every single Jew, even Bobby Fischer, he'll come back, and he'll be at peace, and he'll be able to embrace who he is. And everyone else, every other Jew who was confused about who they are, they're, they're gonna have clarity, and the whole world's gonna have clarity. And it should be really, 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 it's, it's been long enough, it should be already now, it should be tonight.